most of us here that are gathered here today have decided to follow Jesus. And um, I want you just to think for a moment about the time before you came to know him, what it was like. And, you know, many of you have been raised in Christian homes, so maybe your memory doesn't take you that far back. But some here, I know, have given their hearts to Christ as older people, and, they, and you know what it was like before you came to know Jesus. And, um, you know, before we came to know the living God, um, we were spiritually dead. We were living in the realm of our souls and our mind, our will and our emotions, but our spirit, because of sin, was, was dead to God. And Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 5 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them, at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. So we're familiar with this passage. Many of us have heard this many times. But when we believed and confessed Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we're saved by His grace. And, and Jesus takes care of the sin issue. And the wrath of God against sin has been poured out in full measure on the Lord Jesus Christ instead of on us. This is good news. This is the good news of the Gospel. As a result, we're brought into a new uh, relationship with God. We're born again in our spirit. So our spirit was dead because of sin, and now it's become alive because Jesus took care of the sin, and the Holy Spirit came down into us and made His home in our, in our spirits. We're cleansed on the inside because of what Jesus did, and we're filled um, with the Spirit of the living God because His Spirit comes and moves into this temple. See, the temple was moved from the outside to the inside. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, we're brought into this new relationship with God. New believers in Christ begin to start living with the influence of the Holy Spirit over their lives and hearts. And that influence begins to change people and conform us to the image of Christ, the character of Christ. In Romans 8 9, we're told, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And further to this, it's important that we understand the Holy Spirit is God. Just as the Father is God, and Jesus, the Son, is God. The Holy Spirit is God, and as such, the Holy Spirit has resident within His person the character of God because He is God. And because He comes and He makes His presence, uh, in, in his, make his, makes his presence in us, makes His home in us, the Spirit of God's character dwells within our spirit. He lives in us. And that ought to affect us. When the Spirit of God lives within us, it ought to impact our character and affect change. And that's why the Bible refers to this experience as being born again. You're born again in the Spirit. You become alive to God in your spirit. His character is, is there, and it influences us it influences us, and it begins to grow our character as we yield to it, as we yield to Him, I should say. So, this resulting growth of character is from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the after effect of this influence is 
and, and how it influences us and how it changes us is called the fruit of the Spirit. So if the Spirit lives in you, there ought to be fruit that comes from that. There ought to be an impact in your life. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 is the centerpiece of what I want to speak to you today. And Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And this morning, I, I would like to turn your attention to one particular element of the nine elements that I just read out to you that make up the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit isn't just this and that and the other thing. It's a combination of these things because th these things represent the character of the living God. And His character is whole. It's not fragmented. So some people say, well, I have peace, but I have no love for my brother. How can you have peace without love for your brother? If the Spirit of God is within you, you can't be cruel and can't be wicked in your behavior and unfaithful. You can't be that because it's diametrically opposed to the character of God. Well, in our flesh, we can be that way. But God desires that we yield to the Spirit, that we walk in, in, in union with the Holy Spirit. And today, I'd like to turn your attention to one particular element, and that element is gentleness. Now, in 1837, there was a Dutch uh, Reformed minister by the name of Bethune, and he stated this. There may be no graceless prayed for or, un or cultivated grace that is prayed for or cultivated less than gentleness. There may be no grace that is prayed for or cultivated less than gentleness. Well, we're here today, and we we'll probably agree when we look out into the world around us, there's not a lot of gentleness out there. But here's a question. As believers in Christ, has, have we as individuals knelt before the Lord and, and asked Him to, to help us to grow into having a gentle spirit. And corporately, have, have we prayed this prayer? Sometimes, yes. Can we pray as a church that our God might make our church a place where those who are hurting and beat up from life's traumas and in need of healing, that they might be able to find a refuge of compassion here? or of giving and of caring? And one of the ten reasons why praying, one of the top reasons why praying gentle, uh, for gentleness does not often make it to our top ten in the list of prayers is that gentleness, I think, is often misunderstood. And I think it's undervalued. In Greek, the, the word for gentleness, epikia, may also be translated as this. Gentleness can be translated as useful kindness. That's a good word for gentleness, a good two-word phrase. It helps us to get our head around it. Years ago, we lived on Vancouver Island. And um, has anyone here lived on Vancouver Island before? So, if you live on Vancouver Island and your family is on the mainland, um, it's difficult to go and visit, right? It's, you feel island-bound. And um, it's expensive to catch the ferry to go to the mainland. So, you make your trips to go visit family periodically, but it's not usually an everyday thing unless you're commuting to work 
or something like that. But most people go once in a while to go visit family. And, and while en route from Victoria to, Nanai, or to uh, Schwartz Bay, I think that's the terminal, while en route there, I, or, or from Schwartz Bay to Victoria, to Wasson. Sorry, I'm a, I've got my very things. This was over 30 years ago. To Wasson, yes, to Wasson. While en route, I would marvel. I, I don't know if you've been on the ferries before and been on the deck looking over the edge. I would often marvel at the sheer power of the ship that we're on. Like, you just see it, and you, feel, you, you look, and you see this wake behind the ship as the propellers are, are just driving this. I mean, hundreds of cars and, and people on this boat, and it's such a big boat, and it's, it's just such a powerful ship. And they had to navigate through the Gulf Islands and, and all, all the way through to the terminal. But you know what used to marvel me more than anything is as we'd be approaching, the first time I went on the ferry, I, I remember like looking at this terminal coming up and this ferry is just steaming towards it. I'm like, man, these guys, they've got to know something about uh, how to navigate and slow this thing down because my goodness, if they didn't slow it down, this could be very bad. And I used to marvel at how uh, the skilled operators of this ferry would be able to back off the throttle just at the right time and, and, and how that ferry would just gently nudge against the, 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 the deck for unloading the cars and, and come to a stop. It's like, wow, that, that, that must take some skill. Well, I mean, in March 26, 1999, there was, a, there was an error that was made by the crew of one of the BC ferries. And uh, I looked in the news there, and uh, it didn't slow down to the point where it should have, and it absolutely slammed into the deck, the, the unloading deck, hard enough to mangle the bow, the bow of the boat and the car deck. And hundreds of passengers were, were trapped for about 10 hours as the staff worked to free the ship and make it safe for people to disembark. Hmm. The collision occurred because there was errors in, uh, in controlling all this power. There's a number of errors that were made, and thankfully in that case nobody was injured, but a person with a gentle disposition and strength of character like Jesus, may be viewed the same way as a powerful ship that is under control. See, the virtue of gentleness as the characteristic of strength under control. Well, you know, the world might say that a person is, uh, is more powerful when they're aggressive and they're angry and they appear outwardly strong. And uh, we must be careful that as an element of the fruit of the Spirit, that we do not view gentleness as weakness or spinelessness. It requires great strength to be truly gentle. Weak characters are often rough and unkind. They despise the quality of gentleness of Christ as a thing that manifests as a lack of strength when in fact, the opposite is true. Now, gentleness is the polar opposite of anger. It's not a temperament or a personality, but it's a quality resulting from the outflow of the love of God residing and being united with our spirit. See, gentleness is submission to God in His Word and to His works. And in our culture, we know it. Gentleness is not a commonly admired quality, is it? You, know, you don't go to the sawmill and, you know, the guys around the table, oh yeah, I want to be a gentle guy. You know, I want to be gentle. What, what do you think the word gentleman comes from? Word gentleman? What do gentlemen do? They treat other people with dignity. 
They know how to treat ladies with respect. They know they could be the biggest, strongest brute physically and be so gentle with the people around them because gentleness is strength under control. Not everybody has that. Some people are like a bull in a china shop. So Paul tells us not to have a worldly mind sh- mindset. Over and over again, throughout the epistles, the church was told by Paul to rid themselves of the things that would entangle them. To rid themselves of the clothing, I guess you could say, of our pre-converted life. And to be clothed with godliness instead. In Ephesians chapter 4, 22-24, Paul says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your mind, and to to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And the apostles in the New Testament, they modeled the character of Christ with their demeanor when they were teaching and, and they were discipling the, the people that, that were starting out the churches, right? They, Paul stated in 1 Thessalonians 2, 48, we were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Wow. When you look, think about that. Isn't that one of the most common and beautiful sights to see a mother's gentleness with her children? This is an illustration. How much more contrasting is it, and, and how much more impressive is it, to see the beauty in a big, powerful man gently carrying and nurturing a baby in his arms. Hmm. It's extremely harmful, I would say, or even disastrous to a family when when human parents display no element of gentleness with their children. In Christ, there are spiritual babies in the church. People that have just come to faith in Christ. People that haven't grown up in their faith. And new believers, they deserve gentle and sympathetic treatment from older Christians as well. And it's honorable for us as older Christians to treat younger Christians with that gentleness that we hear about here, that the apostles treated the people that they were ministering to in the church's in the, in the first century. Paul tells us in Romans, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. In Proverbs 15:4, King Solomon said this. He says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life. But a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. See, the, the nature of the flesh, the nature of the sinful man is to assert one's rights and authority over others. And so our tongue um, becomes perverse and not how God intended it to be. The tongue is a restless evil. I think the scriptures say that. Who can control the tongue? Right? You, you as, a, as a sinner... Before, in your pre-conversion, you you can't control that. But God can help you to control that. And as a matter of fact, He desires for you to have control over that. Because He desires that each of us as believers build others up. And this is part of having the attitude of Christ and pushing away from the the attitude that is presented so often in the world where it's about me, myself, and I. See, but not only is gentleness 
uh, with others a good idea when they're new believers, we also ought to show gentleness to people who are suffering, who are suffering from spiritual illness. Now, I have a great deal of respect for the medical professionals who have compassion on their patients, and, and they treat their patients with, with gentleness, yet sometimes w- with firmness when the patient is acting unreasonably in a way that's going to cause themselves harm, right? But you know, you know that, right? Physically ill people, like if you, if you are ever sick, you're not always at your best on how you respond to everything, right? If you're in pain, oh, man, it's like if you've got a toothache, you're not always, you know, cordial in the way that you talk. You might snap something, you know. You might say something that you normally wouldn't say. See, sometimes hurting people are not thinking straight. They, they get frustrated and they speak out of turn, saying things that are not nice or appropriate. They might manifest their hurting condition by being touchy or having a poor appetite. can manifest in different ways, right? When you think in the physical realm. And in the spiritual realm, hurting people, wounded people, the same way, might be touchy. They might have a poor appetite for the things of God and His Word. So many people have taken hits in life, and they're walking around wounded spiritually. And when we mix with people who are wounded in heart, how do we respond to them? In our sinful nature, we can be pretty impatient, can't we? (laughs) Or we might just plan on steering clear of them. We might be tempted to use rough words and rough impatient treatments of them. But the truth of the matter is this. Some sickly soul needs the gentle touch of a person that loves them in the name of Jesus. This is one of the exemplary things that you see in the nursing profession when you go to the hospital. When you see someone doing their job as a nurse, well, doesn't it bring such refreshing healing inside? If you've ever been in the hospital and you've been treated roughly, it doesn't make you feel all that good, right? It just makes it worse. But when someone takes the time and is gentle with you, I remember when I cut off my thumb, how wonderful some of the the nursing staff and the doctors were with me. I I remember that and, and how good, how much of a difference it made. It was so good. Sometimes when people are spiritually wounded, they lash out. They say things that may, we might be tempted to get offended by and get hurt by. But you know, a- as believers, we need to see beyond what's on the superficial. When someone is lashing out, when someone is doing something that hurts us, we need to see that person is expressing a wound. And we need to be gentle in our approach with that person. Have we got that right all the time? Absolutely not. Some of the most regretting things that have ever happened to me has been when I have been condescending or not sympathetic and rough with somebody who uh, really needs a gentle touch. They need me to be the hands of Christ. I'm not saying that we molly coddle um, dysfunctional, terrible behavior that hurts other people. No. It's just like a nurse, right? She might have to say, nope, uh, you, you can't do that. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, did I snap at you? Well, maybe you did. You see, as a leader in the church, I'm going to speak to leaders now. We're talking about board elections coming up here. (laughs) You're going to come in contact as a leader with people who are going to cause you difficulty. It's just going to happen. Because there's so many people out there that are wounded. And they're expressing their woundedness in a way that may be not palatable. 
It's going to turn you and make you tempted to prove a point with them. To be right. To resent the fact that they are responding to us so poorly. But as the Lord's servants, we cannot afford to take such treatments personally and lash out. This is, that's not the character of Christ. Lashing out is not the character of Christ. And I, I dare say that it's not just believers that are leaders in the church that need to be attentive to this. I believe that all of us are God's servants. You know, we have the opportunity when people are angry and frustrated and bitter and they spout out something to respond to them appropriately. We have that opportunity. But it's only going to be by the power of the Spirit in us that we're going to be able to check our tongue and our tongue becomes a thing of healing instead of something that tears down. I'm not saying we don't talk to issues if they're needing to be, but how we do that is all the world of difference. Now, I mean, 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24, the Apostle Paul is, is talking to this new pastor, Timothy, and he, and he says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. When a hurting person comes and they want to fight, no, don't have anything to do with that. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. This is not something, folks, that we in our flesh can do. But I, I dare say this, that as a person that walks in step with the Holy Spirit, this is something that God can help us to do. He is the helper. In Isaiah 40, the prophet Isaiah predicted how the future Messiah would be a shepherd to his children who were likened unto lambs. I love this scripture. The Messiah was predicted to treat his children in this way. In verse 11 of Isaiah 40, he says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. Isaiah 40 paints an interesting picture of the nature and the character of our God and Savior. But if you have that scripture in hand, and you read the verse prior, verse 10 says this, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and He rules with a mighty arm. His, see, His reward is with Him and His recompense accompanies Him. Did you see this? Your Savior, your Savior comes in power and might and the strength of His arms is beyond comprehension. Yet, he gathers the little lamb into his arms and gently meets that need. Why? Because it's resident in his character to be of velvet and of steel. God doesn't call us to be weaklings. He calls us to be strong. And to, be, and to see things be beyond what superficially might appear to be the circumstance. Christ is Lord over everything. But He is also the Good Shepherd. And how does this apply? The lambs. He shows tender care for the young converts, for the weak and battered believers, and those carrying the burden of a sorrowful spirit. The tender lamb unable to keep up with the flock who falls behind, who becomes weary and exhausted, the one that wanders off. The strong shepherd brings that lamb close to himself and carries that lamb 
when need be. (laughs) When it comes to how we relate with other people, when you think of gentleness, think Jesus. And what did Jesus say about himself in regards to gentleness? He said this, he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, what a scripture. That's our master. That's the king of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who in his might and his power sustains all things through his powerful word. This is the creator. So what can we learn from our creator? Taking on the yoke of Christ means being connected to his team and working in participation with him in the cultivation of people's hearts as he directs it. To learn from him, when he says learn from me, is to become an imitator of him. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, the scriptures say, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Follow God's example. Follow the example of Jesus. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. (laughs) This means that like Jesus, we are to be strong as iron in our resolve to do what is right, even if it costs us a terrible price. But also for us to look around and be other-centered, to look around and to see others that are broken or bruised, who need encouragement, who need it to be lifted up with a gentle and humble approach. The question that might be asked then is, well, that's very fine, Pastor. We see the, the encouragement to do this. But how is this gentle and humble spirit cultivated? I try and I just can't seem to shake my temper. I can't seem to shake my condescending nature that kind of gravitates there whenever I see something that doesn't agree with me. I, I can't seem to do this. Well, you see, it's not in you, yourself, that you're going to be able to do this. You can try, but you're going to gravitate to the old, the old nature when the buttons are pushed. The only way that you're going to cultivate this is by yielding to the Spirit. Yielding to the Holy Spirit. Well, some of us are, by nature, quiet and timid and shy and maybe we're introverted and and gentleness comes easier to us. Some of us are, by nature and our personality, outgoing, extroverted, and maybe a tad aggressive or maybe a little more than a tad aggressive in our in our, in our personality. Well, what if, what if I'm not naturally bent to being, pa- uh, to being uh, gentle? What am I to do with that? Well, I think we need to be honest with ourselves, first of all. Like, let's look at it. Do we have a problem with this? Do I have a problem with being gentle to others? To being compassionate to those that are broken? Okay. I think each of us needs to go, undergo a spiritual MRI. When you think about that, okay, well, I mean, there's x-ray and there's, I mean, there's different things, right? There's ultrasound and what's the other one? I'm missing one. What's that? CAT scan, yeah. There's those things too, but usually the best Scanning device is an MRI, right? So when you think about that, on February the 19th, right, I, I've got an appointment booked in Kamloops to have an MRI on my lower back because I have back pain. And I've been talking to my doctor about this for a while, and they're, they're going to have a look. They're gonna, I'm going to go into that tunnel and, and get examined. Whatever. I mean, it's going to be maybe a little 
claustrophobic or something, but anyways, I'm going into this magnetic tunnel to get, it's going to show the doctors where the, the problem is. It's going to pinpoint it. Now, now, all of us, maybe in our lives, right, all of us have had injuries of some sort. If you haven't, you're a very um, unique individual. <laughs> Most of us have had injuries. And, uh, you know, some of us are accident prone, so we have lots of injuries. Yeah, that's me. Okay. But regardless of whether an injury is caused by trauma or an injury is just something that we were born with, the doctor orders an MRI to see clearly what the problem might be so that they can come up with a plan on how to address that problem. It's not just to see the, the problem just for the sake of seeing it, right? The purpose is, in seeing a deficiency that, that is occurring or a problem, that they might develop a solution to address it. I'd like to ask you a question. Can a person really change the hand that they have been dealt with in life? Think about that for a moment. Can a person really change? Well, one thing's for certain. Spiritually speaking, King David spoke the truth when he stated this in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O oh Lord, know it completely. You have hemmed me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. See, God can shine His MRI on us and spot the problem. When we can't, we can't attain it. We don't know what's going on. All we know is it hurts. And in the same chapter in verses 23 and 24, David says this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The only way that we're going to know what's going on inside of us, is to humble ourselves before the Lord in prayer. And to ask Him, Lord, expose in me what is really going on inside. I don't even understand myself, but You know exactly how I was knit together. You know what happened even before I was born. And You know the trauma that I've endured in my life because of the hurts that have, have, have taken place. You know, Lord. You know me. And only You, O oh God, can review it. And only You, O oh God, can help me. The, this is why spending time in prayer and in meditation of God's Word is so, so important to us. The Word of God is illuminated by, by the Holy Spirit to us, and it's God's MRI on our spirit. And if we're honest with ourselves and we say, Lord, show me. Yielding to His MRI, God will show us what's going on inside. But after we've been shown by God, changes need to take place. There needs to be there needs to be a remedy. Whether the defect in our spirit has been forged in us by a traumatic event and, or whether it's something we've carried with us our whole lives, our God is a mighty healer. He's here and He wants to change us. And He wants to heal the brokenness inside of us Sometimes like a person who breaks their arm and it's reset wrongly, we nurse it and we don't want anyone to touch it. God, I don't want you to touch that part of me. It hurts too much. It hurts. Well, God sometimes has to get in there and perform surgery. And sometimes that surgery means breaking that again 
so that it can be put together and healed correctly. Because God knows in His sovereignty what we need more than what we think that we need. God is a mighty healer. He's the great physician and we need to invite Him to help us and to change us. We've all gone through procedures by doctors, most of us anyways that are older, by earthly physicians and surgeons, right? We, we know that it's not always pleasant. I don't always look forward to getting um, adjusted by the doctor's uh, prescription. We're subject to making mistakes. And doctors sometimes, if you've been in the hospital or if you've, you've been treated by them, sometimes they make mistakes, don't they? Sometimes they misdiagnose something. They give the wrong medication. They give the wrong treatment. The surgeon goes off, off a little bit and the problem ends up becoming worse, not better. We have heard stories about this. Maybe you've experienced that. But I want you to, to know today that spiritually speaking, God is not a doctor that makes mistakes. He is perfect. All His ways are just. He knows all things because He is omniscient. Omnipresent, all-powerful, all omnipotent. He is a God that understands every fabric of your being. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. Nothing is hidden from His sight. And you can come to Him. And He is a God of compassion. He's a God that will not turn you away. He's a God that will treat you in His gentle arms. And He'll carry you. And He'll bandage your wounds. And He'll bring healing. When we humble ourselves before God, He will give us the right remedy. Guaranteed. Why do we have... Do you have a hard time with gentleness? Well, look at Paul, right? Look at Paul. He was witty and intelligent. He was quite the intellect. But he was alt, and he was naturally aggressive, right? Before Paul was converted, what was he? He was a persecutor of God's church. He saw people thrown in prison. He was there giving approval to Stephen's death, the first martyr of the Christian church. He wasn't known for gentleness. Well, how about Peter? Peter, remember when Jesus was threatened? What did Peter do? In his flesh, he grabbed a sword and he took a sword to defend the Lord, to cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. Did Jesus commend Peter for doing that? No. Actually, Peter got rebuked for doing it. What did Jesus say to him? He said, those who live... Put away your sword, Peter. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And then he took the ear, the one that Peter cut off, and he gently put that back on that man's head and healed him. And this was all as Jesus was being prepared as a sacrifice and he absolutely knew where he was going. He knew what was happening. It's the same spirit that says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, a gentle, Proverbs 51 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In verse 18 of that same chapter. He's a hot-tempered person, stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. You see, Paul and Peter, neither of those guys were naturally gentle. That wasn't their disposition naturally. They weren't gentlemen. Paul was a Pharisee, and Peter was a rough and tumble fisherman. But yet, each of them underwent spiritual surgery and were transformed by the Spirit of Christ into new men. Men who were two of the greatest leaders from the inception of the church. Consider Peter. He said, 
In 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, he said, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's the Peter that cut off the ear after God got a grip on that with him. Peter was <laughs> conformed as a severer of ears to a gentleman. Have I severed someone's ear? Have I given them the full blast of what I think? Maybe I need to reevaluate my approach as a believer. God's calling me to. Paul, he was a sharp-tongued Pharisee. The Pharisees were sharp-tongued. And in Philippians 4 or 5, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Did you hear that? Paul's instructing all believers to joyfully display the attitude of Christ preceding his return and to be gentle and let that be evident to all. I pray that today God would illuminate your heart with his wisdom and that he would help you apply what the Scriptures have said here to us today. May the fruit of the Spirit hang heavily in all of its elements from the branches of our lives. Amen? Let us pray. I'd ask the uh, worship team to come forward.